Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Adam. I would also like to uh, thank you. Um, thanks to Dr. Hanauer and Dr. McDermott and Dr. Loguero. So today's talk is on the modalities uh, used for differential diagnosis of the pouch disorder that are including pouchitis. So the, I classified this uh, pouch disorder to the, um, into the five main category. Surgical mechanical uh, complications, and inflammatory complications and functional neoplastic and systemic uh, comp um, metabolic complications. So the basic surgical complication has two main categories. Either has a leak or stricture. Leak can do the sinus to the abscess and then angulation to the, of the bowel and intrinsic stricture can cause a blockage. And the inflammatory type is a main representative is the pouchitis and also cafitis and the Crohn's disease of the pouch. And the functional part actually is two main category. One is irritable pouch syndrome, other one is called dyssynergic uh, uh, defecation or anismus. And as we know, the, the pouch surgery did not, does not totally eradicate the uh, risk for colon cancer. And there are some metabolic consequences too for, from the surgery that include anemia, vitamin B, uh, D deficiency, as well as uh, um, uh, stones, kidney stones. Now, the main differential diagnosis list for pouch disorder is irritable pouch syndrome, dyssynergic defecation, or anismus, Crohn's disease of the pouch, and cafitis, and refractory pouchitis actually has a consisted of three forms. I go over each of the items briefly. Now, irritable pouch syndrome, as a, by definition, is you have normal mucosa and unbiopsy and a histology. And it, but you can see that even like do the endoscopy, you can see the spastic um, pouch. And actually, the, the functional pouch disorder has uh, um, several categories. And the majority of the patient has functional pouch disorder is represented by the irritable pouch syndrome. The next common one is anismus. So irritable pouch syndrome, actually, it's a disease, spect uh, disease spectrum. So you can see the hyper or hypo mod, um, uh, mod, uh, motility and sensitivity. In the hyper side, you have irritable pouch syndrome. And then next one would be it's a Levetta ani syndrome, pouchalgia, fugax, and sawtooth contractions. In the hypo side, you have a mag pouch or pouch inertia, and or pseudo obstruction. And in the middle, it's a anismus. Now, we use this tool, the Barristat tool, to detect hypersensitivity, visceral hypersensitivity. These slides also showed that people with the irritable pouch syndrome has a um, hypersensitivity in terms of the gas, urge, and pain. Now, when you do the biopsy, sometimes you can do the tricky, ask the pathologist to stain the EC cells into chromophore cells. It may have the EC cell hyperplasia as well as a mast cell um, hyperplasia. Now, these are the um, slides that show the, the, uh, this uh, uh, the serotonin expressing EC cells. So, now, next one is uh, anismus. Anismus, you can use the manometry to detect that. And then the, the typically, you see it is like if the pouch contract, the pelvic floor muscle should relax, should the up panel, and the lower panel should anismus. Actually, the pouch contract and anal sphincter or the uh, pelvic floor muscle contract at the same time. And the treatment is biofeedback. So let's go back to the, 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 the things again. Now this is a, I see it's, yeah, this is a dysnergic defecation. Now this, the, this showed, it's like when you have a refractory cafitis, refractory pouchitis, sometimes they are not responding to any medical therapy. You're looking for functional disorder. Actually, they, when you see this, this is a, uh, f uh, four studies uh, published in the patient with uh, anismus, and the majority of them had the concurrent cafitis and the pouchitis. I think that if the people had uh, this refractory disease, you may 
try to do the biofeedback therapy first rather than give antibiotic therapy or suppository therapy. Now, Crohn's disease of the pouch is also very common in patients with, with the ileal pouch. Even in those with a preoperative diagnosis, diagnosis of the Crohn's of the ulcerative colitis or indeterminate colitis. Now, what's the diagnostic criteria for Crohn's disease of pouch? Everybody uses a different term. Why? because there is a confounding factor, mainly from surgery, ischemia, NSAID use, etc. Now here is I proposed this diagnostic criteria, and first of all is a non-case granuloma on histology, and the late onset, typically six to 12 months after ileostomy closure, and if you develop people, uh, patient develop perianal uh, the fistula, or the ulcer and the structure outside of the common location for ischemic injury, which is anastomosis, in pouch inlet, and at, uh, stoma site, or also at the afferent limb beyond the 10 centimeters of the pouch inlet. Now, regarding the vaginal fistula, not all vaginal fistula is related to Crohn's disease. The left side actual vaginal fistula is caused by the surgical trauma. You can see the, the hole next to the anastomosis, and it can be detected by the placement of the guide wire. But the, the mucosa around the orifice of the veg, this trauma is clean. And the right side of the panel, you can see the, the fistula opening at the dentate line, the anterior wall of the dentate line. The anal canal is clean. This can be related to the cryptoglandular fistula, or the short term is the anal gland infection. Now, in the middle, you have the granular tissues, granular new mucosa, and then the fistula opening at the middle of the canal, the anal canal. This is related to Crohn's disease. Sometimes you use the biologic agent as a diagnostic trial to differentiate these three conditions. Now, cephitis. Cephitis is, a, we used to think is a cephitis is a residual ulcerative colitis. But this is the classic pouch, uh, cephitis. There's other forms. So the other form that can be the part of the ischemic changes that including cephitis and distal pouchitis, and can be part of the Crohn's disease, or is an important one, it is from the anterior pouch prolapse. So if you don't see the diffuse inflammation, circumferential inflammation, this is the classic form of the residual ulcerative colitis. If the, you will see the inflammation only in the anterior wall of the cuff, think about a prolapse. And this is a concurrent uh, uh, disease with the uh, from the ischemia, distal pouchitis and the cephitis. The next one, it is the classic one from the, from the prolapse. It's, you can see the inflammation only located in the anterior wall, which is four or five o'clock. Uh, the position, when you put the patient in left lateral position, um, that you can see this is the anterior wall inflammation, but the other part of the cuff is normal. This is related to prolapse, so the not all Cephitis is related to residual ulcerative colitis. It can be related to mechanical problems. So regarding the refractory pouchitis, you typically will say it's a refractory antibiotic therapy, and some of them are also um, refractory to the even steroid therapy. Now, you classified into the three main categories, microbiota associated, autoimmune associated, or ischemia associated. So, now, when you see the diseased pattern of the pouchitis, you can see the, the, the trend. The people with the FAP hardly had a pouchitis. And then you can have an infrequent flare-up, we could have episodic pouchitis, and some of the patients had frequent flare-ups, it required a frequent antibiotic therapy, or even maintenance therapy with antibiotic or probiotics. Now, if the patient had developed a pouchitis immediately after stoma closure, you always keep in mind is any um, mechanical issues or surgery related uh, issues. And then we noticed in the last few years, uh, some of the patients can maintain the pouch very well and then slowly develop the pouchitis. And we found out it's the, probably the risk factor is a weight gain, especially in those male patients. Now, it's important to document the degree of inflammation when you do the pouch endoscopy, but it is also important, even more important, to document the distribution of the pouch inflammation. 
The classic, we call a microbiota-associated pouchitis, the inflammation localized or limited to the pouch body. And upper part of the small bowel, or the, the proximal the, uh, to the inlet of the pouch, we call the aphen lin, was normal. Now, if you have an autoimmune or, or immune-mediated pouchitis because, because it's a systemic factor, and the pouch inflammation can be extended into the small bowel or even limb. The diffuse inflammation in the small bowel and pouch body with a wide open pouch inlet and the mucosal pattern of the small bowel inflammation and the pouch body inflammation are similar. So a classic example is a PSC associated enteritis and a pouchitis. You can see the left panel is a diffuse inflammation of the aphen limb and the right side it is a diffuse inflammation of the pouch. In the middle is a pouch inlet. I compare lower panel, which is the patient with a diffuse ulcerative colitis, with a back wash ileitis, and a fish mouth type of uh, ileocecal valve. Now, some of the patients who have the refractory pouchitis, you may request your pathologist to say, do the IgG4 stain. If you, the, the uh, mucosa loaded with the IgG4 expressing a plasma cell, then those patients we may related to the IB, uh, I, IgG4 uh, plasma cell infiltration, and then they may benefit from the steroid therapy rather than antibiotic therapy. And some of the patients had the, the feature of the always, always like, almost like a GVHD-like. You can have a, you see the ex, excessive number of the, the apop, uh, apoptosis body in the mucosa biopsy, and those patients may also benefit for anti-inflammatory or uh, immunosuppressive uh, medications. Now there are some overlap. You can overlap with the extra intestinal manifestation, with the PSC, with the IgG4, with antimicrosomal antibody positive or ANA positive, or you can have, have a concurrent autoimmune disorder too. So these were labeled as an immune-mediated disorder. Now, last segment is actually a new concept. I hope like this, some of the surgeons in the audience and uh, uh, agree with me, but it can be controversial. So, I make the word said 80% of the chronic pouchitis in terms is a technical. The microbiota may be a secondary factor. So this is a big deal. So it started with, the, when we do the study with the people with a C. Diff infection, we found a C. Diff infection of the pouch 80% or 75% are male. Why? Uh, now, this is the mucosa pattern, the inflammationary pattern of a classic ischemia pouch. You can see the half of the pouch inflamed and the half of the pouch not inflamed with a sharp demarcation along the suture line. Now, this is an important study. You can see the cuff is inflamed, cuff is inflamed, and then you push the scope through, and you find the pouch also inflamed, but half the pouch inflamed, and the other half is normal. Now, the inflamed part typically at the aphen lin, start with the aphen lin of the J pouch body, and the sparing the even inside, this is the classic the ischemic pouch, then we will do the retroflex. So again, when you do the pouch endoscopy report, please document the degree of inflammation as well as the distribution of inflammation. They will be very helpful. And those patients typically not um, respond to antibiotic therapy, even anti-inflammatory therapy. So now here's a ischemic uh, pouch has three patterns, either at the aphen lin inflamed and the sparin aphen lin. In the middle, you have the distal pouch is inflamed and also may involve the cuff too. And the third pattern is uh, also along the suture line or pouch inlet or at the tip of the J area. This is the, the example. Now we notice also, this is the classic example, that since 2012, we have uh, noticed the patient had gradually gain weight. And the weight, majority of all uh, patients in our pouch center, we uh, do the pouch endoscopy every year. Here's my documentation. Over the years, correlated with the weight gain, the patient has this pouch started to great inflamed and inflamed more. Now here is another thing. You can see the weight gain associated with the contracted pouch. You will see the pouch volume is decreased. So this prompt us to do the uh, theory of the studies, we found that the last item, you can see the weight gain more than 15%. You have the 70% of the chance the patient had developed a pouch failure, more chance of developed a pouch failure, 
resulting from the either pouch anastomotic leak or chronic pouchitis. Now, why this is like the, the, the slides I borrow from Dr. Fazio is that sometimes it's like especially male obese patient, they always have the, uh, most of the time the surgeon may have the difficult to, to encounter the issue of the rich. That means a mesentery is not long enough to create the pouch and to the anastomosis without anastomotic attention. So now this is a J pouch and an S pouch. Sometimes I have the, with a hot, rich area, and you can do the S pouch. S pouch give you advantage. Advantage, you have less mesenteric tension, give you about two centimeters the advantage. So that leads to the, the frequency of the chronic pouch artist. Is a frequent pouch artist is like the J pouch is a 13%, and S pouch, we almost never saw the chronic pouch artist. And the cook pouch is 80%. So this is a risk factor of a pouch failure. This is the slide I didn't um, go through it. OK. Now, we also noticed that the, the visceral fat gain, more than 10%, is associated with a, with a uh, pouch failure, or sinus, or pouch artist. And then we also used the, the M MRI now me uh, measured the fat around the pouch. Fat around the pouch, this is the classic example that people have, the, the, this patient had distal pouchitis and caphitis, and you can see the, how much fat around the, um, uh, the, the, the pouch. Now, fat maybe is a passive organ. It may active, active, or active organ. The fat can produce a lot of the cytokines and, and uh, um, pro-inflammatory uh, mediators. And this is the slide that showed that the pouch fat gain, the around the pouch fat gain, is associated with the pouch survival too. So now show the slide again. And this in, this in the left side is a J pouch, and in the center is a S pouch and a cook pouch. And then again, the S pouch because it has no anastomotic tension and the patient hardly develop chronic pouch artis. As behind the reason behind that it is this, uh, the fat issues and rich issues. Again, the emphasize this one is uh, the tension, the mesenteric tension in the J pouch and the less tension in the S pouch. Now, here is a summary of the, uh, the theories, the mesenteric fat with the edible kind or cytokine or ischemic component that cause a tissue ischemia, tissue hypoxia, and interrupted the barrier function. That resulted in dysbiosis with the pre dominant anaerobes that including CTF infection. Now, how do we tell? Sometimes we use the uh, contrast uh, CT scan the MRI. So the ischemic pouch has no uh, um, and mucosa hyper enhancement versus the chronic pouchitis related to the other etiology or Crohn's disease pouch, you have a, a mucosa hyper enhancement. Now, when you do the biopsy, actually ischemic pouch lack of the classic feature of ischemic colitis. But however, you can ask the pathologist to say, do you have a hematoidin deposit outside of the cells? So the hematoidin deposit, extracellular compartment may suggest the presence of the ischemic pouch. Now, we are starting to use the hyperbaric oxygen therapy for the people with a chronic pouch artist, especially ischemic pouch. And then we also had the data showed that for some reason, with the map, they help the patient with a chronic pouch artist 50% of the time, and that including the people with the ischemic component of the pouch. We don't know the, the mechanism behind that. So the basically, the, the, this is a summary um, uh, table. It's a, a microbiota associated pouch artist, autoimmune associated pouch artist, and ischemic um, um, associated pouch artists. You can see that uh, um, make the difference into uh, differential diagnosis that based on the di distribution, based on the histology, and mucosa hyper enhancement, and lab test. And regarding the treatment is different for the microbiota associated pouch artists. We use the antibiotic or probiotics. Uh, autoimmune associated, we use the uh, immunomodulator therapy, even the biological therapy, or steroid. And ischemic associated pouch artists, and we, we use the hyperbaric oxygen. We are studying it, start to send the, those patients with a super obese patient to the bariatric surgery. 
and those patients may, may be uh, the benefit of redo pouch surgery. Now, this is the important slide too. Actually, functional, structural, and inflammatory pouch disorder can overlap if you have a refractory disease, and I think about if the patient has any mechanical issue, especially, or functional issue, such as a prolapse or anismus. Now, this is my last slide, and we need to stratify the etiology of the pouchitis, the bacteria-related, immune-mediated, or ischemia-related. Then overlap with the other inflammatory disorder, it can occur, that including concurrent pouchitis and cephitis, concurrent cephitis with Crohn's disease or with the pouchitis. And when you do the endoscopy, it's important to document the disease distribution. And then when you do the biopsies, sometimes in the patient with the refractory disease, you ask the pathologist, say, could you stand EC cell, IgG4 cells, or can you take a look at the, the um, extracellular hematoidin? And the, the overlap between the structural and the functional disorder, those patients you may benefit to uh, test the barristat, anal rectal manometry, and the bearing defecography. And now we're starting to measure the fat, either CT scan or MRI, and then it may have the uh, diagnostic and the pro prognostic uh, implications. This is my last slide. Thank you for your attention.